3. In writing the short story, I may have seemed to dwell too much on the need of considering every detail in its plan and development, yet the short story is an improvisation, the temporary shelter of a flitting fancy, compared to the four-square and deeply founded monument which the novel ought to be. It is not only that the scale is different, it is because of the reasons for it being so. If the typical short story be the foreshortening of a dramatic climax connecting two or more lives, the typical novel usually deals with the gradual unfolding of a succession of events divided by intervals of time, and in which many people, in addition to the principal characters, play more or less subordinate parts. No need now to take in sail and clear the decks. The novelist must carry as much canvas and as many passengers as his subject requires and his seamanship permits. Still, the novel theme is distinguished from that suited to the short story, not so much by the number of characters presented as by the space required to mark the lapse of time or to permit the minute analysis of successive states of feeling. The latter distinction, it should be added, holds down even when the states of feelings are all contained in one bosom and crowded into a short period, as they are in the Kreutzer Sonata. No one would think to classify the Kreutzer Sonata or Ivan Illich or Adolphe among short stories, and such instances prove that difficulty of lying down a hard and fast distinction between the forms. The final difference lies deeper. A novel may be all about one person and about no more than a few hours in that person's life, and yet not be reducible to the limits of a short story without losing all significance and interest. It depends on the character of the subject chosen. Since the novel about one person has been touched on, it may be well, before going farther, to devote a short parenthesis to its autobiographical or subjective variety. In the study of novel technique, one might almost set aside the few masterpieces in this class, such as The Princess de Cleves, Adolphe, and Dominique, as not novels at all, any more than Musset's Confession du un enfant du Cisque is a novel. They are, in fact, all fragments of autobiography by writers of genius, and the autobiographical gift does not seem very close related to that of fiction. In the case of the authors mentioned, none but Madame de la Fayette ever published another novel, and her other attempts were without interest. In all the arts, abundance seems to be one of the surest signs of vocation. It exists on the lowest scale, and, in the art of fiction, belongs as much to the producer of railway novels as to Balzac, Thackeray, or Tolstoy, yet it almost always marks the great creative artist. Whatever a man has it in him to do really well, he usually keeps on doing with an indestructible persistency. There is another sign which sets apart the born novelist from the authors of self-confessions in novel form, that is, the absence of the objective faculty in the latter. The subjective writer lacks the power of getting far enough away from his story to view it as a whole and relate it to its setting. His minor characters remain the mere satellites of the principal personage himself, and disappear when not lit up by their central luminary. Such books are sometimes masterpieces, but if by the term art of fiction be understood the creation of imaginary characters and the invention of their imaginary experiences, and there seems no more convenient definition than the autobiographical tale is not strictly a novel since no objectively creative efforts have gone to its making. It does not follow that born novelists never write autobiographical novels. Instances to the contrary will occur to everyone and none more obvious than that. Described as the link between the real novel and the, and the autobiography in novel disguise, this is Geoff's Werther. Here a youth of genius, as yet unpracticed in the art of fiction, has related, under the thinnest of concealments, the story of his own unhappy love, the tale is intensely subjective. The hero is never once seen from the outside. The minor figures are hardly drawn out of the limbo of the unrealized. Yet how instantly the difference between Werther and Adolf declares itself. The latter tale is completely self-contained. 
It never suggests in the writer the power of the desire to project a race of imaginary characters. Werther does. Every page thrills with the dawning gift of creation. The lover has not been too much absorbed in his own anguish to turn its light on things external to him. The young Giall, who has noted Charlotte's way of cutting the bread and butter for her little brothers and sisters, and set down the burgundous humors of the sylvan charm of the ball in the forest, is already a novelist. 4. The question of form, already defined as the order, in time and importance, in which the incidents of the narrative are grouped, is, for obvious reasons, harder to deal with in the novel than in the short story. The most difficult in the novel of manners, with its more crowded stage, and its continual interweaving of individual with social analysis. The English novelists of the early 19th century were still farther enslaved by the purely artificial necessity of the double plot. Two parallel series of adventures, in which two separate groups of people were concerned, sometimes with hardly a link between the two, and always without any deep organic connection, were served up in alternating sections. Throughout the novels of Dickens, George Eliot, Trollope, and the majority of their contemporaries, this tedious and senseless convention persists, checking the progress of each series of events and distracting the reader's attention. The artificial trick of keeping two stories going like a juggler's ball is entirely different from the attempt to follow the interwoven movements of typical social groups, as Thackeray did in Vanity Fair and The Newcomes. Balzac and Le Père Goriot. In these cases, the separate groups, either, either families or larger units, in a sense impersonate the protagonists of the tale, and their fate are as closely interwoven as those of two or three persons on the narrow stage of a tale like Silas Marner. The double plot has long since vanished, and the plot itself in the sense of an elaborate puzzle into which a given number of characters have to be arbitrarily fitted, has gone with it to the lumber room of discarded conventions. But traces of the parallel story linger in the need often felt by young writers of crowding their scene with supernumeraries. The temptation is especially great in composing the novel of manners. If one is undertaking to depict a section of life, how avoid a crowded stage? The answer is, by choosing a principal character's figures so typical that each connotes a whole section of the social background. It is the unnecessary characters who do the crowding, who confuse the reader by uselessly dispersing his attention, but even the number of subordinate yet necessary characters may be greatly reduced by making the principal figures so typical that they adumbrate most of the others. The traditions of the theater Francis used to require that the number of objects on the stage, chairs, tables, even to a glass of water on a table, should be limited to the actual requirements of the drama. The chairs must all be sat in, the table carries some object necessary to the action, a glass of water or decanter of wine be a part of the drama. The stage realism introduced from England a generation ago submerged these scenic landmarks under a flood of irrelevant upholstery, but as guides in the labyrinth of composition, they are still standing, as necessary to the novelist as to the playwright. In both cases, a far profounder effect is produced by the penetrating study of a few characters than by the multiplying of half-drawn figures. Neither novelist nor playwright should ever venture on creating a character without first following it out to the end of the project, to the end of the projected tale, and being sure that the latter will be the poorer for its absence. Characters whose tasks have not been provided for them in advance are likely to present as embarrassing problems as other types of the unemployed. In the number of characters introduced, as much as in the scenic details given, Relevance is the first, the arch necessity, and characters and scenic detail are, in fact, one to the novelist who has fully assimilated his material. The moon-enchanted hollow of Wilming Weir in Sandra Belloni is as much the landscape of Amelia's soul as of a corner of England. 
It was one of George Meredith's distinguishing merits that he always made his art as a landscape painter contribute to the interpretation of his tale, so that such scenes as that of Wilming Weir, the sunrise from the top of Monte Monterone, in the opening chapter of Vittoria, and the delicious wallflower-colored picture of the farmhouse in Harry Richmond are all necessary parts of the novels in which they figure, and above all are seen as the people to whom they happened would have seen them. This leads to another important principle. The impression produced by a landscape, a street or a house should always, to the novelist, be an event in the history of a soul, and the use of the descriptive passage and its style should be determined by the fact that it must depict only what the intelligence concerned would have noticed and always in terms within the register of that intelligence. Two instances, illustrating respectively the observance of the neglect of this rule, may be cited from the novels of Mr. Hardy. The first, the memorable evocation of Egdon Heath by night, as Estatia Vi looks forth on it from Rain Barrow. The other, the painfully detailed description in all its geographical and agricultural details of the Wessex Vale, through which another of Mr. Hardy's heroines, unseeing, wretched, and incapable at any time of noting such particularities as it has amused her creator to set down, flies blindly to her doom.